to migrate over from the waiting room into the main event here. If you have any audio or video issues, um, try leaving the presentation and coming back in. That usually fixes things. For those of you new to Click Meeting, which is the, the format we're using, uh, there's a chat feature in the bottom right-hand corner. You can type in stuff to communicate or questions at the end. We're going to do Q&A at the end of the event. But uh, if you need to communicate, you can do that there. We'll get started here in just a minute. All right, and we'll go ahead and get going. Good evening and welcome to this week's installment of Florida Talks at Home. My name is Alex Buell, the Programs Coordinator for Florida Humanities. Normally, Florida Humanities works with cultural partners across the state to put on programming like this in person, but obviously that can't happen right now. Our goal is to make this virtual series a regular event until we can begin convening people once again. Next week's program will be on August 18th at noon and will feature a panel of scholars discussing African-American women leaders during the suffrage movement. You can register for this event on our Facebook page or on our website, floridahumanities.org. At the end of tonight's presentation, we have a very short survey. Before signing off, we greatly appreciate you taking a moment to fill it out. If you have any questions for the speaker, please type them in the chat field in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and she'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Martha Biretta, the director of the Blanchard House Museum of African History and Culture in Punta Gorda. She is the fifth generation Floridian and a descendant of one of the founding families of Punta Gorda. For over 30 years, Dr. Biretta has consulted, lectured, written about social issues relating to race, gender, class, power, and culture. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Biretta. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, and welcome all of you to this presentation. So happy to have you back with me again. Many of you, I've just seen some of you have come back. We're gonna be talking about an era that had just tremendous impact upon America and how we view race and race relations in America. I cannot express enough the what happened in the Jim Crow era and why it happened. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Okay, Alex. All right. One of the things I want you as you're, you're sitting here and you're listening, just kind of, and maybe you can discuss this maybe at the end, what motivated you to take this class? I know uh, there's a lot going on right now in our country, and perhaps that was one of the reasons that you needed to understand what's going on in our country. Also important, you may wanna mention this as we go through at the end when we have questions and answers. I would be interested, and I'm sure that the other people who are listening, what kind of experiences did you have? Did you maybe live in the North and come South? and was shocked to see uh, colored and white uh, drinking fountains. So what was your experience? Did you have any experience with Jim Crow? Now, our goal in this session, of course, is to help you become aware of some of the laws and customs. There were not only laws, and you're gonna hear this and see this, there were Jim Crow customs as well. Customs that whites had to learn, customs that Blacks had to learn. This, this whole era, I actually find it to be quite a fascinating era because of the impact that it's had upon America and upon race relations. Secondly, uh, to identify stereotypical images that remain in the collective American mind. The images, and think about this era, this came about after Reconstruction, but some of those same images continue to be in the American mind. And I will mention at least two of those major images that are still in the American mind. Thirdly, to understand how this whole era of Jim Crow continues to influence, of course, what's happening in our country today as it relates to race relations. And then to understand, and this might be a little, you may have to say, hmm, what's she talking about there? 
But to help you understand that Jim Crow, racism impacts all Americans. So while it did have basically impact, and it does impact African Americans more, it absolutely has had and continues to have some bearing on the lives of whites in this country. All right, let's get started here. All right, first of all, the Supreme Court decision here. All right. It's important for us to understand that the laws of this country, all the way from our Supreme Court, have supported racial inequality in this country. If you go all the way back to Dred Scott, and then you come forward after uh, Reconstruction, and Reconstruction was said to be that period in time where absolutely uh, that was could be a new beginning for us. However, that did not happen. There was a Civil Rights Act that was passed in 1875, but because of the political influence, we did go all the way to the Supreme Court, 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, and the Supreme Court, actually the highest court in the land, acknowledged Jim Crow and what they said, the separate but equal. And of course, I think most of us know that it was never separate but equal. It was not until 1954 that we had the, the very first act by the Supreme Court that kind of uh, had some bearing on Jim Crow laws. It was, however, not until 1964 with the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that real change came about. And of course, in 1965, the Voting Rights Act. So just think all of those years we were governed, and I think, I think at least for 78 years, we were governed by Jim Crow. Okay, what was it? All right, Jim Crow was laws, as I said, and customs. Um, and they came about because of wanting to, to regain that, that whole sense of uh, white supremacy. The, you know, it was very much a part of that white supremacy ideology. Uh, there had been, you know, the enslavement period and then with the Civil War, after that, you know, of course, we got into the Reconstruction, the Radical Reconstruction. And so the power elite in particular were very interested in getting back this whole idea of white supremacy. And so one of the things that uh, was done was to build in these laws. Now, very important, and we're going to talk about this more, we, we had the laws and the customs. But this racial caste system came about um, after you know, the end of Reconstruction. And a lot of times we think, oh, it was only in, in the South and in the border states. However, there were Jim Crow laws. They may not have been called that, but if you had laws that were redlining laws where African-Americans could not buy a house in certain areas, let's say in Chicago, that was also a Jim Crow practice. Okay, again, you see it's institutional, an institutional form, and that's because of law and custom. What it did, of course, is you can see it favored whites because the, the bottom belief system, and this is what's important is to understand that belief system. The belief system in white supremacy ideology is that white is superior, black is inferior. Now, it's very interesting just white by itself has no meaning unless it is just opposed with the opposite being black. So when you have this system of, of supremacy, Jim Crow ideology, you have to say, first of all, that there's one group that is superior and another group that is inferior. 
But unless we have the other side of that, then just whiteness has no meaning in itself. So it was a system of both segregation and discrimination that, of course, in almost every aspect of African-American life, barred African-Americans from any kind of equality. Um, it, it did, not only did it, it do that for uh, African-Americans, and I want you to think about this a little bit. One of the things that, that happened with this whole uh, institution of racism that did come about, if you check your, your history books, came about basically after uh, Bacon's rebellion back in 1697. Uh, prior to that time, there was, well, in 1619, when the first blacks came, first Africans came, there were no white people here. They were saying, oh, wow, there were no white people here. Well, people were either English or they were call themselves Christians. We were a class-based society, two groups of people, the people of the ruling class and the indentured servants. Then, of course, the Africans came over. First Africans were not slaves, they were indentured. The system of slavery did as they discovered that, hmm, Africans, when you look at this system, it's on the long run, we could bring Africans in and they only brought Africans in who were able, who had the skills, the agricultural skills that they needed. So they brought the Africans in. And what happened was that the indentured class began, you know, the whole thing, if you come over and you're indentured, you're supposed to be able to take part in this. You're supposed to be able to grow some tobacco and become a rich man too. Too many of these indentured Europeans were starting to want their freedom. And so the ruling class then devised a method of divide and conquer. And they had to do this because there were actually the number of European indentured outnumbered the Africans who were here. But when the indentured servants, the Africans and some Native Americans got together, that was a force that could really overthrow the ruling class because there were so many, many more of them. And so the ruling class had to devise a method of divide and conquer. And what they did was to devise, to, to create whiteness and blackness and create racism. And so this whole idea, Jim Crow, came about after the Civil War to go back to that kind of control. Okay, uh, 1828, this uh, Thomas Daddy Rice observed some, some black men who were, were doing a dance. And one of the things, one of the laws, I guess uh, the African-Americans couldn't cross their legs. And there's some... Christian thing that they couldn't do. And so they kind of shuffled along with this. So Danny Rice uh, saw this and said, hmm, this is a way that um, I can make some money. And so what he did was put this chalk, you know, blackened up his face and all of this. And he started doing this little routine. Well, the minstrel shows at that time, this got to be very popular that you could imitate and show this picture of this kind of stupid, comical black man shuffling along. And so what that did, people really uh, enjoyed seeing that. But what it did also was to reinforce that idea of the inferiority of the black, okay? Here you've got this shuffling, stupid, silly old man. And each time this played and played into the collective American mind, this image, of black became more and more profound. Okay, we can understand this. And I think we went through, a, this is the rationalization. Um, the whole thing had to do with the fact that this, this whole ideology built upon, and I say, and it is a myth, uh, the mythology of white superiority and black inferiority. And so what you know, this whole ideology says in every single way, whites are superior to blacks. Now, part of this system, this whole thing between this one, you know, you see the, the photograph of the, the men hanging there. One of the things that 
and this goes back to 1697, before the creation of whiteness in Virginia, in the colonies, mis miscegenation was rampant. Uh, there were stories told and jokes made about all of the children there who were mixed. And so part of what had to happen, you couldn't have these people running around who could pass as white, okay? So you had to do something to make sure that we could keep everybody under control. One of the first things that was done was miscegenation laws to stop this relationships between Blacks or Africans and Europeans at the time. Uh, at that time, before 1697, Africans and Europeans, many of them Irish, they worked together, they married, they had children, and they rebelled together. It was the rebellion of these groups joining an alliance because all these people were in the same position. They were all servants. They all belonged to the same class. And in order to stop that, there had to be the institution of racism created. And so you can see here that the whole thing of uh, this whole sexual relationship, that was just feared. Because if you have this sexual relationship, then you're going to produce people who many of them could be white because you could not tell the difference. And in fact, I have read that at least of the early people, uh, the early Europeans that came, is that at least 25% of all African Americans have some quote unquote white blood. And that all did not come about through the rapes that happened. Much of it came about, especially in those early colonies, because people were free to love and to marry who they wanted until the institution of racism. All right, so it was pervasive. It impacted every aspect of African-American life. I'm talking about from the cradle to the grave. The hospitals had to be separate. The cemeteries had to be separate. Every aspect of American life, it had to be presented so that the African-American was inferior and the white American was superior. And so one way to do that would be to make a law that are laws and customs that made it impossible for you to ever, for an African-American to ever have the same place in society that white Americans, who are now white Americans had. Okay, here are some, you can see all of the ways in which Jim Crow operated. Of course, schools, that was a biggie because, and, and it went a little further. You know, many of the politicians who were very opposed to integrated schools said, you know, your daughter is going to be sitting in class with a, a black guy. And, and what happens, they start to see each other. So the separate schools, uh, the whole thing of, of intellectual and inferiority that the blacks really probably couldn't learn and didn't need to be in school with white kids. But at the bottom line had to do with those relationships. Um, actually, it was a criminal offense for Blacks and whites uh, to attend the same schools. Also, and this, and I want you to think about how the rights of whites were affected also. It was a criminal offense for a white person to teach a Black child. And so not only were the, the rights of Blacks affected, but the rights of whites were affected also. And of course, uh, Blacks could not go to the state-supported schools. What happened is that uh, in the state of Florida, in fact, I had some much older cousins, uh, they were able, the, the state would pay for them. Uh, all of them got their degrees, their master's degrees from um, Columbia because they could not get a, a master's degree here in the state of Florida because the schools were segregated. They went to uh, you know, Florida A&M, which was Florida uh, Agricultural Mechanical College at the, the time, or they could go to the Boone Cookman but they they getting a, a master's degree. So the state, rather than having them go to a white school, would pay for them to get a degree from somewhere like Columbia University. Uh, there were white jobs. Um, it's very interesting. Um, 
when, when I was coming along and I grew up in the 50s and you know graduated from high school in the 60s, I basically had to go to college, okay? Because I could not work in a bank, could not be a teller in a bank, could not be a clerk in a grocery store, could not even be a secretary in a state building. So my choices were either I did domestic work or I went to college. And so for many of my generation, that's what we did because our parents had done domestic work and they always said, we need to make things better for you. So as you can see, there were white jobs and the jobs that black people did. Now I have to say at my age, I am amazed when I see people who are designated as white working at some jobs, like working on the highway. When I was growing up, that was a black job. And so when I see the way that the economy has been so that people are having to do all kinds of jobs, it's kind of amazing to me having grown up when there were colored jobs or Negro jobs and there were strictly white jobs. When I was growing up, it would have been impossible for me to have a white job. So I had no choice but to go to college so that I could have a profession. Uh, vagrancy laws, again, that the whole thing in segregation is if you were not working where they thought you should be worked, the vagrancy laws came into effect so that you could be picked up and you could be put to work or you have to pay off that debt by working for somebody. And so, um, again, even in the workplace, these, these laws applied, you know, people being separate in the workplace. And travel. This is a very interesting one um, in terms of every aspect of it. You know, the waiting rooms uh, right here in Ponta Gorda. Um, uh, thanks to my mother, Bernice Russell, who was a historian here. Uh, we still have, and we just put a sign up indicating why we have kept the the uh, the the different entrances, the white and colored my mother felt was very important for people to understand and for that to be a teaching tool. Uh, in our depot, you cannot go into the white or colored waiting room. You have to go through the main part. But that's what I grew up with. We would take the train. My father was from Virginia and we would take the train. And so we would have to be on a certain side of the wall. And we would have to wait until it was time for us to board the train, which of course was after the whites boarded. And so in our waiting rooms, the baggage rooms, all of this was separate. Now, the public accommodations, which you got on the train, uh, we went to the colored car. And the colored car was closest to where all the soot and the smoke and all of that was. Uh, the dining hall, again, uh, there was the colored aspect of it, you know, ate in the, the colored uh, dining hall, dining um, the coach on the train. So all of this was um, in, in terms of the public accommodation and, and public spaces, you know, uh, the swimming pools, the libraries, all of that was separate. And so um, eating and drinking, uh, I tell you, um, and, and, and I'll go into this a little more, but one of the major rules of Jim Crow had to do with whites and blacks eating together. Very interesting rule the fact that you could not sit down and break bread together. Even in private homes where you might have a domestic person work, a uh, domestic working an African-American, you may consider her, oh, she's just like family, but she could not sit at that dining room table and eat with the white family. And the eating and drinking was just very interesting. In my early years, I grew up in a small town in, in Southwestern Virginia and uh, an African-American man, uh, had a brilliant idea. He had the broad, he, he established a broad street tea room. And what Mr. Sharp did was he divided the, the, uh, the tea room. On one side was the black side, on the other side was the white side. You could actually see the people eating and drinking on the other side, but you could not eat and drink with them. So all kinds of public places, as I said before, swimming pools, whatever, all of this was segregated. Uh, one of the um, the things with swimming pools, you know, there was the, 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 the stereotype that black people were dirty or they may have carried germs. So we did not want them in the same swimming pool. So all of these uh, kinds of 
of images, and we'll talk those images of what were so important. Okay, now I just mentioned this. Whatever you do, you cannot eat and drink together. And you may think, mm, but that was a major rule. That was something that you did not disobey. Uh, shaking of hands, again, because if you shook hands with a person, that implied that you were equal. Blacks were not ever to believe that they were equal to whites. Um, this whole thing about the purity of white women, this white womanhood, this was used in so many occasions as the excuse for lynching a black man or for even burning down black towns such as Tulsa or Coney right here in Florida. And so uh, a black man, and that's what happened little Emmett Till, in no way, he, he just was a child and he didn't realize you know, him saying anything to a white woman would get him killed. This, all black men, under no circumstances, you didn't offer her a cigarette, you didn't speak to her, you didn't brush up against her. If she was on the sidewalk, you got off of it. Any kind of anything that had anything to do with the white woman offending her in any way was something that could get a black man killed. Again, look at this, <laughs> African-Americans, uh, you know, and it should be uh, white Americans, were African-Americans were introduced to whites, not just Americans, uh, were whites, but never whites to African-Americans. Um, titles, very interesting. A, a black woman was never Mrs. or whatever. She was always called by her first name. That even went so far as with, uh, professors, you always notice, if you look back at some of the literature, you see that right here in our town, Benjamin Baker was never called Mr. Baker. They would call him Professor Baker, but Mr. and Mrs. were terms that were never used. Again, if you're riding in the car with a black, with a white person, you sit in the back and uh, at the intersection, you know, you know why our four-way stops? And when that happened, um, you were supposed to let the, the white go first. And if you were in a lane, you know, whites always went first. My mother, however, was one of those people who said, um, she turned her head and she said, oh, well, she just ignored the whole thing. And there were African-Americans who kind of disobeyed Jim Crow laws. There were African-Americans, like my mother, who would take a sip from the white fountain when nobody was looking. And I've talked to many African-Americans of my mother's age in particular who would do that kind of thing because it was, it was silliness. Because they, you know, and I've, I've talked to whites, a white child who had to say, I need to see if the water's colored. And of course it was the same water. Okay. Again, as I told you, when whiteness was introduced, um, the first group of white indentured servants had to be taught to be white. They were just Europeans. So one of the ways was, of course, they were segregated. They were given uh, some advantages, better clothing. Uh, up until whiteness was created, these indentured servants, they lived together. They all ate together. Once whiteness was introduced, the racism was introduced, then, of course, they had to eat separately. They had to live separately. And so this whole system of learning to be white, whites had to learn this as well as blacks. And keep that in mind. Whites had to learn how to be white, okay? Jim Crow, of course, reinforced that with laws. This is the way that you're supposed to act. And here's a law that will prevent you from making these associations that you should not have with people who are black. And of course, Blacks early on had to learn that there's some rules that you obeyed. And as I said, there were many African-Americans like my mom who kind of, um, even though they were considered to be white, but uh, inferior by whites, did not feel that way about themselves. And so uh, they would disobey some of those things when nobody was looking because they felt that this is crazy. Nobody's superior to me. I'm, 
you know, we're all the same. So, but we were all taught that because of the threat of violence, that we had to at least pretend to obey the rules, uh, that we had to follow that pattern. Because if you got out of your place, violence was what could be could come to you, is if you misunderstood your place. And that's what the, the ideology of white security, of white supremacy did, was to fix the places fix the physical place of African-Americans and whites to, to some extent, but also to give whites the, the emotional, as, as W.E. Du Bois called it, the psychological wages of whiteness, which an esteem, a place that went with being white. Okay, so this is one of the things that, that as I've looked at the Jim Crow era, because of the kind of images you're gonna see in a few minutes, it had, even more than slavery, the Jim Crow era reinforced and perpetuated racism in our society. Um, even though the laws have been changed, they're still in the collective American mind. These images remain. And as we go through this, I kind of want you to reflect upon, hmm, which of those images do I still hear about or do I still see? And so these, these same images, it's amazing that since 1877 and beyond, these images, think of all those years, that even though the laws have changed, the images are still in the collective American mind. It has been an indoctrination process that has been used racist propaganda, and it has been very, very effective. Okay, this is why we have stereotypical images. This is what, when the first members of the ruling class, when they set this up, this was what, what had to happen. They had to shape the beliefs of what they at the time called common Americans, common whites. They had, because there were two groups of whites. There were the elite whites, and there were the so-called common whites. But they had to shape the beliefs, the attitudes and perceptions of common whites about blacks. They had to reinforce this whole ideology of white supremacy. And look at number three. Part of this whole thing about the stereotypic images was to instill psychic well-being in whites. This, but that psychic well-being, that was a method of control. So it's very important, even though blacks were at the, the worst end of it, to understand that Jim Crow and racism was also a control mechanism for the average common white. Okay, images. Uh, we, when you look at culture, culture is composed of the basic belief systems. Uh, it's composed of the uh, values of the, of the culture and the language and the symbols, which are the images. And so when you look at the, the symbols, the images of white supremacy ideology, uh, we see that race was used as one of those images. Race is very, very powerful. It can bring up the unconscious in individuals. Individuals who think that they are just not even susceptible to all of this, those images are repeated and reinforced until they go into our subconscious mind. They don't always operate at a conscious level. And so what these did, these images were emotionally saturated and they gave real power when they were used. Okay. Alex, are you there? It's not moving. Okay. All right. Uh, these images of African Americans were always exaggerated. If you think about some of the pictures, and you're going to see some of them here, uh, usually, you know, the, the, the mouths, they, they made them animalistic. What had to happen with these images was to dehumanize the individual. 
And so you had these huge uh, lips, big white eyes. Uh, when I've looked at some of the pictures, um, there was a, I think it's called the Green River Whiskey. The, the man who's intro, who was advertising it is a black man, but his hands are like the hands of apes. He's got these really hairy arms. And so what happened here was as long as you could dehumanize this person, you did not have to treat them as an individual. If you dehumanized an African-American man, you could lynch him, you could burn him, you could castrate him, you could even take his fingers and ears as souvenirs and take them home. You could take your family to a lynching. A newspaper could invite 2,000 people to come to a lynching because of the image of the black man, the brute, he was no longer human. There we go. Okay. Now, as I said before, if you take a look, look at that picture. Look at how they look. Look at their eyes. Look at their hair. And look at what they're eating. That's one of the stereotypes too. Uh, was the watermelon. However, if you were at my, you saw my last presentation, watermelon did come from Africa. And early on, uh, some of the after the enslavement period and after Reconstruction, a lot of African Americans. Uh, made money selling uh, watermelon. And it probably uh, a little bit of envy and them being out of their place, they started then to attach a stereotype to eating watermelon. Okay, this... Uh, very interesting, the watermelon, the alligator, the, the cotton, you can see the cotton there. And, but the whole, all of this was used um, to support the, the whole ideology of inferiority. Uh, if you've ever seen the, the, the young uh, black babies or black men, especially the babies, uh, they were called alligator bait. And actually, I went and got my, did my graduate, some graduate work at the University of Florida. And not until this, this latest controversy came up, I never realized uh, what that meant, the, um, the hands doing this. And when I looked at some of the pictures, it, it did have some uh, image, stereotypical image there, because African-Americans, especially the children, were known to be alligator bait. Okay, now, the poor black man, the most vicious, pervasive, and enduring stereotypes of all African Americans have to do with the African American man. Now, first, there was Sambo. And Sambo was okay, because what Sambo did was say, hmm, he's happy, he's contented, Slavery is not so bad. This is good for the African. However, after emancipation and after reconstruction, a whole new image had to be created. And it was the image of the brute. And it was especially during that time that this whole aspect of the, of the purity of the white female and that every African-American man wanted to rape a white woman. This is when this came about. But this image had to be created to keep black men in their place. Okay, so as you can see here, as I've already said, uh, take a, just take a look at and read that for a minute. Uh, the, the role that the Sambo played and the role that the brute played. Again, these are images that were created. These images had to be established and created. They, they were not always there. And when the first Africans came, the image of the Sambo was not there. The image of the brute was not there. These images were created for a reason, to subjugate the African, the black, and to control the beliefs, the attitudes, and the behaviors of whites.
Now, this is really interesting. Uh, back again, uh, early, late 1800s, really early 1900s, when we got into, really into consumerism in, in America, one of the things that happened, of course, was we got into advertising. What uh, happened, though, was it was felt because race had this emotional pull to it, was to use Africans, Afri uh, Blacks, to sell products. And one of the things that happened was, one of the things that in the thinking of the, the advertisers, well, you know, every white person is not able to hire or have a domestic, even though domestics were paid barely anything. They weren't able to have one. However, let's go to Aunt Jemima. If you can have a black person making your pancakes and you can pour out the syrup, then you can feel good that this person is inferior to you. And so advertising was one of the major ways in which this whole image of black inferiority was cemented in the collective American mind. And as you can see here, uh, they had real meaning. This, this was uh, very interesting. And it's interesting in that um, the images were really meant for the collective white mind. I, although there are some blacks who, of course, internal, which call it internalized racism, who internalize them. Uh, but I was talking to my son there, and, and I used to buy, I bought Aunt Jemima pancake mix. It never occurred to me uh, to take that in and for it to have a meaning. That had meaning for whites. It did not have meaning for African Americans. Okay, so here you go. Uh, you can see more, just take a, a minute or two to read this. Uh, and especially when you come down to number three, because what this did, just keep in mind the psychic well-being and the social standing of whites. All of these things, these, these stereotypes, these images, what it did was to create this feeling of whites are superior, blacks are inferior because they're serving you. Okay? They're the cookie jar. They're the Aunt Jemima. They're the syrup. They're the uh, gold dust twins who are selling detergent. All of these black, inferior blacks are in their place and they're serving you. Okay, look here. You take you take a look here, um, and you can see here. Looking at these images, look at them. See what they're doing, and just always look at the the look at their features. Look at what they're doing. Very important. What was the message? This is the whole thing with images. Images are symbolic. Images carry messages, and these messages were reinforced and perpetuated. The idea of white superiority and black inferiority. They all carry the message. Okay. Now, Benson, uh, 1988, wrote, you know, did some writing, and he said that uh, actually, you know, the, the stereotypical images did something for the, the well, psychic well being of whites. Um, because what they did, uh, they helped, and look at number three, they helped a certain class of whites, common whites, to identify with the upper class white race. And in general, rather than looking at their own material or economic condition, these images help them to believe we are all the same. We all have the same interests. Yes, the same race interests, but not necessarily the same material and economic privileges. But this, uh, when you know, it came about, when we started advertising, this was a way to bring the white identity together. For, African, for white Americans, common white Americans, these images helped them to feel white, to feel like I am one, I am one with the upper class. And here, just take a look. You can see some of these, uh, 
see her, Miss Piccaninny, she's selling the oranges. This, these are the kind, this, when we're talking about these, think about how many images were out there. And as you look at each of these, as you're looking at them, I want you to just get a, 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 a word, the first word that comes to your mind, you might complete this sentence, black people are, okay? So as you look at the first one, you look at the second one, you look at the third one, What's the very first word that finishes the sentence black people are? Okay, again here, look at these and I think all of us, I actually, I used to collect these myself. Uh, think about the fact if, if you've had any of these in your home, if you've had the creamers or the pictures, or I have a beautiful, uh, and you might have a cookie jar. If you have a cookie jar, a doorstop, whatever. Think about if you had these in your home. And what was the message that this particular object gave? What was the message that was there? Just think about the message. And again, I was, I was in a class earlier and somebody said, oh, I wish I hadn't bought. No, you don't have to say that. I wish I hadn't bought it. Blah, blah, blah. No shame, no guilt. Just think about. What was the message? Okay, and here again, as I just said, take a look at those, okay? Did you, you have any of these in your home? And what might, as you see at the bottom, what relevance do distorted images created during that Jim Crow period what do they have now? There, there's that little alligator bait down there. There's Aunt Jemima. You know, we're having that little thing going on with Aunt Jemima. But just take a look at these. I think most of us are familiar with these to some extent. Look at the guy on the left. Look at the mouth on him. I tell you. And that's probably was really frightening. You know, this man might be after my wife or my daughter or my sister. That was the image that was supposed to create fear in the mind. Okay, so again, there was there was no there was never any innocence to stereotypical images. As, as you saw in the first slides, there was a reason why they were created. They were created, of course, to subjugate blacks, but also for the psychic well-being of whites. And I just said these, and you can just take take a minute there to just uh, look at those, okay? And and as you can see, this is why um, you know these images. You know, uh, again, we we come all the way now to to polls and and the the whole thing about the poll taxes and all of that. This is very interesting. A uh, fact that an older gentleman right here in Ponte Gorda who identifies as white said that, hmm, those poll taxes didn't just hurt black people. Did you know how many poor white people couldn't vote because of poll taxes? And actually I, I did, um, I was very curious because my uh, my ancestors were, were one of the first blacks to settle in Ponta Gorda. And so I was very interested in voting. And back in the twenties when we still had uh, poll taxes, 126 black people voted here. They were able to pay their poll taxes. But this old white gentleman said, you realize how many poor white people couldn't pay poll taxes? And so, again, it was one of the things we have to look at is how racism hurts and hurts all people. All right, let's come to our wonderful state of Florida. And I see I'm easing up on my time here. Florida was one of the states with the, the most and the most severe penalties in terms of Jim Crow. Uh, the harshest penalties you can see right here. Look, look at some of these. Just take a look at them. That, that if you saw somebody who was happened to have a relationship between a black and a white, if you were informed on them, okay, you could get some of the money for informing on them, okay? So if a white person wanted to have a relationship with a black, their right to have a relationship, 
they could not have that right. Looking at, look here, 1873, but in 1967, and I remember this, the, Sar the city of Sarasota passed the, the, the ordinance saying that the, the beaches uh, had to remain segregated. Very interesting, very interesting. But Florida laws, Florida had some of the toughest laws related to Jim Crow. Now, again, here, relationships. Um, this, this, this whole thing here, if you take a look here, look at the second one, um, the kinds of things that, that happen uh, in terms of relationships. Uh, you know, I see now, we see a lot, I see a lot of white grandparents with their little mixed grandchildren and all, but this whole thing, uh, had so many, um, this is whole miscegenation going back to if people who are of the same social class, if they form alliances, then the ruling class, the ruling elite, their power can diminish. And so all of this, especially relationships, was meant not to diminish power. Okay, uh, I told you about the education. Just take a look at this. <laughs> She'll not be taught at the same schools. And but check this out. Um, you know, like there were real. This is Florida now. There were real penalties for doing this. And so, if you decided that you really, if you were white, you said this is nonsense. I, you know, I, I want to go around and teach at that school. Honey, you could pay a price for that. Again, you're right to go where you want it, to be with black people, to teach black kids, to have a meal with the white, you with the black, you could not do that either. Okay. And you see this? Look at 1913. And we're talking 1913, which is, you know, it's a while back. But look at the law here. Who does that infringe upon? It was a law made for whites. It was unlawful for white teachers. Okay, look at 1927. You, again, all of these laws, they keep bringing up all of these laws. So every time there probably was somebody who was not obeying the law, our legislature went right to work to make sure that this did not occur. All the railroads. Oh, this was always a big one. Just take a look here at, uh, you know, riding in the same railroad car. Uh, very interesting. I'll just give you a minute to read that about the railroad cars. And I'm seeing all kinds of chats that are coming up. And yes, 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 yes. Okay. <laughs> very interesting. Take a look here. Now, Florida, I have to tell you, Florida was pretty tough. Okay. The Sunshine State, I always often when I do a workshop, I say it was not the Sunshine State for African Americans. OK, it wasn't at one time. Florida had more lynchings than other southern states. OK, uh, again, here, are these are some I just want to let you so you can see I'm looking at my time here, wanted to make sure that you saw the laws here that have been passed. Uh, as it related. And you see, see how late some of these laws, look here, 58, look at that. And this is after a Brown, okay? After Brown, many of the school districts decided they'd either build a, a, a black high school or whatever school so that they were, the white, the blacks would not want to integrate. Because the, the only reason really that the blacks wanted to integrate was because of the inadequate blacks may pay taxes but they got inferior resources. They, they, the books, the books I studied out were books that came from white schools that had already been used. In my biology class, we had one microscope. And so what blacks wanted, said, okay, for Plessy versus Ferguson, we absolutely wanted, if it was gonna be separate, we wanted equal. And so that was not the case. And so rather than have the integration, 
then you, you saw some of these uh, laws that were passed later. Okay, and you see uh, that, oh, I went back. Did I go back? Yeah, I went back. We went back, Alex. We need to go forward here. Yep, let's keep going forward. Okay, here we were. So uh, look, take a look at this list. Every aspect of black lives and white lives were impacted by this, mostly black lives. Look at all of the places that Jim Crow said had to be segregated. Every, let's look at this, it's amazing. Truly amazing. Look at the sale of wine and beer. Can you believe that? <laughs> we know parks and, and beaches and all of this. Oh, take a look at church. Uh, I forget who said this, but it, it has been said that during the age of Jim Crow, that 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings was one of the most segregated places in America. And that was true because whites and blacks could not be in the same congregation. That's, that's amazing. And so I come to the end of this, um, this institutionalized racism that really was reinforced and perpetuated during the Jim Crow era. It um, has remained with us. Um, right now, what's happening, you know, the George Floyd, what came out of that absolutely had to do with a stereotype of black men. Uh, the, the fact that uh, Trayvon Martin or a little 14, a little kid in Cleveland, Tamar Rice, who was threatening to police. You know, here's a child. These images are still in the collective, especially white mind. These images are there. And so we see what uh, Michelle Alexander wrote, the new Jim Crow. We see that. And this is, continues to happen because these images are still in the American mind. That is why we still are having racial problems in America, because these images, in order to ever get past this, we have to acknowledge these images, we have to confront them, and we have to challenge them. Okay, and as I mentioned before, uh, you can take a, a look at this. Um, one of the things that, that I strongly recommend is that if you're really interested in changing any of this, is that you talk to your school boards and you talk about teaching true American history. I, I, the governor did sign um, a, a law that in November, of each year, we will be talking about the Holocaust that happened in Florida. In November 4th, which was 100 years ago, on election day in 1920, was the most violent day that was has ever occurred in election history in America. That's when the city, the community of Okoye near Orlando was totally burned down because African Americans went to um, vote. And we uh, at the, the Blanchard House Museum here in Ponta Gorda, and as I was talking about some of it today, um, I think that might be a virtual um, exhibit that we might put up. And, and I'll let Alex know and let Florida Humanities Council know if we put that exhibit up again. But this, here's some of the things that we had on uh, an exhibit. I have to tell you something about, you see that sign in the back, Colored Women? I was trying to sell, I was trying, I did sell my condo in uh, Tampa, and I told you, I collected black memorabilia. My cousin uh, was my realtor, and he was showing my condo to uh, you know, people, and, and it was bought by whites, but I had the colored women sign on my bathroom door downstairs, and my, Daniel came at me and said, Martha, are you crazy? How do you think you're going to sell this condo with the colored woman sign on your door? But I, as I said, I used to collect this and uh, some of it was, you know, we had, these were some of the items that we had in our exhibit at the Blanchard House Museum. 
And if we ever open again, please come back and visit us. You see the Aunt Jemima's, those all actually belong to me. Um, and in the back there is, uh, has to do with pear soap. That was a little girl saying to the little uh, black girl, oh, don't you use pear soap? And that was saying that the black was uh, dirty. She was inferior. But all of those, yes. All right. Alex, I think I'm just a minute over, but I want to uh, get some questions here if somebody wants to ask. I just love all of your comments here. Um, thank you so much, Sharon, for, for being with us. Um, oh, and I do. I will, I will come, I will get on the, um, the August 18th. I, I do want to see that because I guess uh, uh, Mary McLeod Bac Bethune, I think she was pretty active in all of that. All right. Um, don't let your heart be broken. Uh, as John Lewis said, see something, say something, do something, do that, do some, uh, what do you call it? What did he say? Get into some, uh, good trouble. Okay. That's what you can do about this, it, this whole issue. Take a look at these. And if there are any that you would like to, um, respond to, uh, and thank you, thank you all of you for your comments. Alex, I hope we can keep these because at some point I'd really like to be able to just take a, a look at them. And, and I, I really um, am so appreciative, Alex, to the Florida Historicus, Florida Humanities Council for doing this work. Uh, believe me, you all are at the forefront of healing. Just having a program like this and the program you're going to do on the 18th, Florida Humanities Council is at the forefront of healing, of helping to be an, an institution for healing racism in this country. And Alex, I applaud you for your choice of programs and for what the Florida Humanities Council is doing. You all are stepping up and you're doing what needs to happen. You saw something, you're saying something, you're doing something, okay? And thank you. Well, thank you, Martha. And. Uh... Lots of great feedback here, and uh, I yeah. typed it in the comments, but we are recording this, so if anyone wants to watch it a second time, it'll be available on our website sometime tomorrow, or if they want to share it to folks who weren't able to uh, tune in for the live presentation tonight, um, uh, probably midday tomorrow sometime, floridahumanities.org. Mm -hmm. Do we have uh, any? Oops, sorry, Alex, let, me, let me say this. Please share this. If you watched it and you can go on and share it with your friends, please share this information. This is information that all Americans need to understand about the Jim Crow era. And somebody had said earlier, is that why the schools were so late? Yes, that's why. We had schools that didn't, Brown was 1954. We had schools that didn't desegregate until the 1970s, okay? And one, an area right near me was one of them. <laughs> How interesting. Oh, please share, please share. Thank you all for your comments. Thank you for attending this. This, this is wonderful. And Alex, always. I love working with this young man. He is so wonderful to work with. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, uh, there's still some people typing. Uh, we can hang out for mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. for any questions, but uh, lots of great feedback. Clearly, yes, people it like is. It. Yeah, a lot of feedback. Hmm. The personal history. Oh, yeah, I went through it. <laughs> oh. okay. a, little, a, little late, a little late with the survey here, but if you're still on, go ahead and uh, fill out the yeah, survey. Yeah, Alex, I'm sorry for going over here. I just no, 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 no. You're, got you're carried fine. away. <laughs> I wanted to leave the, the reflection questions you had up for folks, so I didn't put the survey up. But if you're still on before you tune off, uh, please take a second and fill out the survey. We appreciate it. <laughs> well, I tried to put it in. That's what our, our time is, is an hour, but I tried to put it in there. And I think I got through, I know an hour isn't long enough, we, we, uh, but we, we tried to do what we can do here. Yeah. We gave you something to think about. <laughs> yeah.
Give folks another couple of minutes to complete the survey. Again, thank you all for tuning in. Um, we have a couple week hiatus of these events. Uh, our next one will be August 18th, um, featuring a, a panel discussion talking about African-American women during the suffrage movement. Uh, August 18th is the centennial uh, marking of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, so kind of a big day. I'm sure there's lots of other uh, women's suffrage related programs that day, but that's what we're doing in conjunction with the uh, Women's Suffrage Centennial uh, Organization up in Tallahassee. Oh, it's also primary day, as I'm being uh, reminded here. Thank you for your comments here. Well, I hope that uh, the Planted House can open again someday. So we're, we're gonna be putting up uh, virtual exhibits until we can do that. So we, we really would like to open, but uh, most of the volunteers are my age and so we, um, and then the people who come to visit, you know, come down to Ponte Gorda or older. And so um, we have to be very careful. And so we, we are trying to protect um, our public and our volunteers. So we will open when we think it's safe to reopen. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about the survey. I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on there. Usually you can, you can scroll through it on the top. What I see is different than what you all see. Hmm. Right, we got a few more people typing and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Someone asked if you think institutional racism can be solved by defunding the police. <laughs> <laughs> All right, of, I, I, I have to I have to laugh people. on that because um, I don't think in uh, what many African American communities will say was that um, many times there is not enough policing, and so I don't and personally believe in defunding the police. I believe though that we do need sensitivity training for police. I think like this this presentation I just did on stereotyping, they need to understand that so that they do not stereotype and profile African-American men. But I also have been reading about um, some of the, the issues that come up with people who are mentally ill and whatnot. And so I, I, I do think that some training that they would have related to social services would be important. So no, I don't believe in defunding the police. I probably believe in transforming police departments. And I, I have done that training to help police departments transform. So not defunding, transforming, okay? We still have quite a few people typing. Oh, really? Let me go back down here then. Alex, what did I do so I can get back to where you are? How did I get back down to the bottom? Uh, you should be able to use the the scroller thing on your mouse. You just hover it over the, the chat box and scroll down. Okay. If your mouse is a little wheel wheel thing. Yeah, but where is it? I don't. See, it won't do it. Come up for me. Hmm. Okay. Don't. I won't worry about it. Yeah.
Oh, here I've seen some people saying that. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. On behalf of all history teachers, uh, one of the things we can do is, is teach accurate American history. And, and we need to teach, just not tell kids, we need to have kids do critical thinking. You know, we can you can do an exercise like this. And the, at the questions that I ask on that, have, have kids think about it. How did Jim Crow take away the rights of both blacks and whites? You know, there, there are ways that we can teach history that we don't teach history. I see that somebody wasn't able to, to complete the survey because it wasn't completely on their screen. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what happened there. You know, some of this, we're at the mercy of technology with some oh, of Oh, yeah. This. Yep, right. we are. Uh, August 18th, the, the day you're having this is primary day too. I'm seeing somebody says, vote, vote, vote. It's yeah. primary day. All right. Yeah, 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 get out and vote. It's, it's yeah, also the you know, centennial of the uh, 19th Amendment ratification, so yeah. just, a, just a coincidence, but yeah, it's a still, still go vote. Day. Yeah, yeah it, it's important. Uh, there are, are people uh, I don't ever miss since, since the time that I could vote because I know like there were African Americans who, who died just to have the right to vote, and so I have to vote. <laughs> Oh, some people are typing now, I see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Loretta, yes, transforming, not defend, not defunding. Someone asked your opinion about the Black Lives Matter organization. Um, I have to tell you. I, I don't know, really, I, in fact, I have a book on my shelf I need to read that was written by, by them. Um, apparently, they, they started something, a movement, and so I don't know probably enough about them to yes or no. I'm going to say yes for the attention that they're bringing to the issues. I, I will say that, to the attention that's being brought to the issues. Uh, I hear a lot of, I hear negative stuff. Now, let me tell you what I don't believe about them. Now, I could be wrong. I don't, I don't think, I, 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 I don't think that they're some Marxist, or, and I could be wrong. I, I don't know if they're a Marxist organization. And the reason why I say that is because Martin Luther King became one of our heroes. We even have a, you know, MLK Day. In the early days, Martin Luther King was, was uh, said to be a communist. And so that label many times is put on people who are requesting change. And so that's about all I can know about it. I, 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 they, if they are, I have to say, well, Martin Luther King was labeled a communist too. So. Somebody's saying, I think you should address the police. Where, who's, Loretta said something about addressing the police. Do you believe that uh, is the police can be solved by, no, no, no. And I think I said that, that defunding, no, it, it's not going to solve the problem of, of racism in police departments. Um, hopefully, well, well, several things, training, hiring, make sure that the people that are hired are people who are able to be sensitive and to respect all people. And so, you know, they're the kinds of things that uh, need to be done. You know, well, Ms. Robinson, um, the only thing I can do is tell you to share this presentation with history teachers. Okay, <laughs> they can. Alex, can't they? Can't they do it? Get it off of. Uh, they can. They can share it with their. Uh... Yeah. Once. Once we have it posted on our website tomorrow, uh, the link, which it's it's just on our Florida Talks at Home webpage. We mm -hmm. have an archive of all of the programs we've recorded. Mm -hmm. You can just copy and paste that URL and share it to whoever, whomever you'd like. Okay. Let me say something. Uh, somebody just came on and said, I don't think, and talking about Black Lives Matter, I think the organization does not matter, the words do. And I will certainly agree with you. The words do matter. Black Lives Matter. 
And I, I know a lot of people are coming up with the all lives matter. And the only thing I can say is I go back to the Declaration of Independence, where it says all people were created equal. Obviously, all did not apply to African Americans. And so that is why the words Black Lives Matter, that's why that has to be said. We have some we have some political stuff now that we probably oh, oh god please probably, no, not, okay folks i am into. just into doing my presentation i am not into politics i do not want to get seriously alex and and i know florida humanities council doesn't either i really do not want to get into the political aspect i, mm -hmm. I want to give you some questions that you can think about because ultimately let me say this as i, I did a class today there's a saying i am the peace i want to be any of this that has to change with healing racism in Americans, I personally have to be the change that I want to see happen. I personally. So that's, that's where I stand on that. Not political parties, on what personal responsibility. Like John, I, I love, back to Mr. Lewis, see something, say something, do something. That's an individual responsibility. All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and end it there. Uh, Dr. Bietta, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. And well, thank, thank you. For tuning in, and uh, we will see you in uh, about three weeks for our next program. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Good night.